Hey, Vinyl Community, how's it going? So this video, I'm going to be jumping on a thread from my friend Gary at Physical Format Rock and Roll. You know Gary, you've seen him on my channel, you've checked out his channel, you've loved what you've seen, and you probably saw Gary's thread video. Now, on Gary's cassette video, starts off the video, Hi, I'm Gary, Physical Format Rock and Roll. I'm starting a thread. It's going to be a cassette thread. And I want you to show me 10 cassettes, God damn it! And it's not like Gary to swear in his video. So when he said that, I'm like, okay, it is on. I am going to jump on this thread. So what Gary wants you to do, and check out Gary's uh, cassette thread video if you haven't yet seen it. What Gary wants you to do is he wants you to show 10 of your favorite cassettes. Chris Profi jumped on this thread. Chris saw the video. He was inspired, uh, and he showed. Chris has an awesome, awesome punk collection, and he's got some Herb Alpert. He's got some Sylvia thrown in there. Don't watch the video anyway. He's got an amazing punk collection. He's showing Black Flag. He's showing MRI. He's showing... Um, uh, the other punk bands on the SST label, but it's a fantastic video as well. So when you're done watching my video, go to Gary's channel, check out the original video, go to Chris's channel, check out his video, and then come back, subscribe to my channel, and watch my video again, preferably from a different account so I get more views if you can do that, if your wife's laptop or whatever. But anyway, I am jumping on Gary's contest. And the winner of Gary's contest is going to get an $80 Amazon card. You're also going to get a case of your favorite beer from the Great Lakes Brewing Company. And Gary is going to throw in an Ohio State jersey. No, it's not a contest. Anyway, I'm getting off topic here. Anyway, I'm going to show 10 of my favorite cassettes and talk a little bit about each one. So the first one I want to show, I'm a Beatles fan and therefore I'm also a Paul McCartney and Wings fan. This is the Red Rose Speedway album. Now this is a very polarizing album. This was the album that followed one of his most um, Uneven, I will say, uh, Wings albums. The very first Wings album was called Wings Wildlife. And he took a lot of heat over that. And so he uh, went and recorded this album. Um, actually put Paul McCartney in front of the Wings. The first Wings album was just Wings. And so many people didn't realize it was, in fact, a Paul McCartney project. And this time he made it very clear. Paul McCartney and Wings. This was also the album before he recorded Band on the Run. It's hit or miss. It's got some okay moments on here. Big Barn Bed is okay. Uh, obviously, My Love was a huge hit single off here. Get on the Right Thing was okay, but it was a Ram outtake. I love the Ram album. Get Off the Right Thing was actually an outtake for Ram that they threw on here. It's got that Ram sound to it. It's got some also very weird shit on here. It's got um, a Loop, First Indian on the Moon, which is kind of a crazy instrumental. It's almost prog rock. It's got this... Uh, section in the middle of it that's just very weird and spacey and then you've got a weird medley it was almost like I did the Abbey Road medley I could do it again well no he didn't do it again in fact this medley is kind of a piece of crap it's all right I mean it's Paul McCartney but it just doesn't flow together well you can tell it's kind of a patchwork um, he does uh, it's a medley with Hold Me Tight not the Beatles song um, he's got uh, Lady Dynamite Hands of Love, Power Cut, it, it just they're all different styles. They, it sounds very thrown together. Unfortunately, Band on the Run would reverse Paul's Solo Fortunes. Much better album, but it, this is okay. I listened to this a lot growing up, and I'm talking too much about one goddamn cassette, so move on, move along. I'm sorry. Okay, you know me as a metal guy, but I do have a soft spot for my synth pop. 
How you like this one? Kaja Goo Goo. Too shy shy. Hush hush. Eye to eye. That's right. Smash hit all over MTV. I think it was on the Billboard number one for like 15 weeks. It was just a phenomenal, phenomenal album. And I do like actually Ooh To Be Ah, which has a very sissy sounding kind of a name, but still, I like it. I don't care. When I go all in on my synth pop, when I'm feeling very nostalgic, whip out this baby and listen to it and it's 1983 all over again so love some kaja goo goo speaking of the 80s i love me some rem also this is one of my favorite rem albums if not my favorite life's rich pageant i love the songs on here this is got this is like that one of the heaviest Monster and this album, I think, are the heaviest REM albums. You got Begin the Begin, just launches right out of the gate with this sonic, brutal assault. Then right into These Days, which is kind of a punk-sounding song. Then it quiets down to Fall on Me, which is a very gentle, acoustic-type ballad. Uh, lots of great songs on here. You got Superman, which is a cover of some band. I don't know. I thought it was an REM original for the longest time. Um, what if we give it away? Great, just a fantastic album, and I love this cassette. I love REM. Now, uh, this is an '80s band that is still recording albums up today. But this is um, the newest cassette that I have by this band. I got all their albums up to this point, and then they're very hard to find on cassette after this one. This is Depeche Mode Ultra. This was, I believe, released in. 95, I think it was. Dave Gahan, their lead singer, had gone through just hell and back with heroin uh, addiction um, after the tour for Songs of Faith and Devotion. So he was not in great shape. In fact, he had to do several multiple takes that were patched together just because he was not in any shape to lay down vocals. Band almost broke up during this because he was in such rough shape. But he pulled it together. He's been sober ever since, thankfully. Uh, but this was the album where he kind of went through hell. And it was like he was uh, in remission, trying to get himself straightened out. Depeche Mode was trying to put an album back together. It was the first album without Alan Wilder, who had really been the workhorse in the studio. The other guy just wanted to record the tracks and then go off to the pub. And Alan Wilder was left to really produce co-produce and make a cohesive album out of the tracks just a little Depeche Mode history but anyway uh very cool I had to get this one off eBay it's an import I don't know if it was ever released in the states but very happy to have that one again people know me as a metal guy a thrash guy you know I in my heart of hearts I am just a hardcore hair metal heavy metal guy uh this is Tesla um, this is their second album, The Great Radio Controversy. Uh, of course, they were sticking up for Nikolai Tesla, and they were like, screw Henry Ford, screw him. You know, the lyrics are very much pro uh, Nikolai Tesla and go to hell, uh, Thomas Edison. Uh, but this was a great follow-up. Um, I mean, you know all the songs off here. Um I'm thinking the biggest hit uh, was probably Love Song, uh, which was a great ballad. I think it made it onto MTV. But if you like the first one, Mechanical Resonance is a lot heavier than this one. And not to say this one is light at all. It's got all the, the great Tesla elements uh, to it. But a little bit more commercial. Uh, they wanted to get into the mainstream. Uh, but everybody in college... Uh, back in 1989, I think, when this was released. Everybody had this cassette. Uh, it was just a smash. And it was sort of like, it's hair metal, but it's sort of sophisticated uh, hair metal. It's not like uh, Cinderella. Uh, this is more highbrow because, damn it, they uh, have a purpose and they... You know, they're all about Nikolai Tesla and the fact that he was the first one to uh, create the radio and all that stuff. So it felt like, well, they're not just singing about chicks and 
having a good time and party and they actually have an agenda they uh, actually have a manifesto it felt like so anyway whatever and speaking of Cinderella you know me as a huge Cinderella guy uh, heartbreak station getting a little more bluesy I mean you had elements of that on long cold winter but this is where they double down on the blues just a great, great album. I mean, Tom Kiefer, for crying out loud. I mean, yes, his vocals do sound a lot um, like ACDC, uh, but, you know, Brian Johnson, I don't think has ever called him out on it. But still, great guitar player, great songwriter. This is just a great bluesy, bluesy album. Um and one that you should check out. Now let's talk about White Snake. Uh, this was their follow-up to their 1987 debut album. Uh, got this a year after. They were very prolific. After that 1987 album hit, they were putting out like sometimes multiple albums a year. Uh, this one was uh, right before Slip of the Tongue. I think there were a couple others they managed to release between this and uh, slip of the tongue. That's how prolific they were back in the day. Uh, but I believe this was their second album, uh, capitalizing on the success of the 1987 self-titled uh, album. But, you know, great song. Slide It In is on here. Slow and Easy. Great track. Um, you got the ballad, Hungry for Love. Just a great, you know, David Coverdale. Awesome. Um, speaking of uh, the ACDC, although I'm going with the Bon Scott era, this is one of my most prized possessions. This is ACDC, the Australian. It's an Australian import of their Let There Be Rock album with the original cover artwork. Check that out. Very cool. Any cassette with a sticker on it means that it's old and it's worth hundreds of dollars. And this one absolutely for sure is. Uh, so I keep this one in a temperature controlled room away from my other cassettes because I want it to be preserved when I'm ready to sell it and retire. Uh, this is a band I never talk about. I love this band. I do. I have this particular album. Not only do I have it on cassette, I have it on CD, and I have it on vinyl. That's how much I am in love with this album, and I think it was because of the time period when it came out. I was in college, and I was just eating up all of the alternative music that was coming out. I was a huge R.E.M. fan, The Smiths, uh, New Order, uh, you know, replacements, all those kind of bands. And this, I felt, was one of the greatest albums of 1988. This had the big hit, um, Under the Milky Way, which still sounds fresh and vibrant today. But you got great tracks on here. Destination, Blood Money, Spark, Reptile. I actually bought this album because I was in a cassette store. It's called Tape World. And I heard Reptile over the... the no, you know what it was? I, okay, now I'm remembering. Um, they had these listening stations where you could listen to an album. You put the headphones on and like scroll through the tracks. And I remember Reptile hearing that and being like, Oh yeah, I'm getting this. And I got it. Still love it to death now. It is a masterpiece. I think the church's best album. They had a couple albums before this one, but this really, I think, kind of broke them through onto uh, mainstream radio. And then they kind of fell back into obscurity. But love the church. Love Starfish. Absolutely a great album. And then the last one I'm going to talk about is The Smiths, The Queen is Dead. Their greatest album, no question. You got the title track, I Know It's Over, Cemetery Gates, uh, Big Mouth Strikes Again, Some Girls Are Bigger Than Others, There Is A Light That Never Goes Out. It is just a masterpiece. It is by far their best studio album. And if you are interested in checking out the Smiths, this would be the place to start. All Smiths are great. They do not have a stinker of an album or a stinker of a song but i would start with the queen is dead absolutely so sorry this video went so long but 
definitely check out Gary's video, check out Chris's video, um, and if you want to do your own cassette video, hey man, let's have it, let's see it. All right, hope you're doing great. Take care.